Right, thank you. So, some of you know that one of my main interests is the uh, the relationship between the, the psyche and the stars in the classical world and the, the medieval world and the Renaissance. And I'm extending that currently into various speculations and thoughts about the space race. Of course, when people go into space, they have a profoundly psychological response frequently. Uh, the uh, space race was only uh, started in the 1950s and 60s because of psychological concerns such as uh, the geopolitical rivalries like the rivalry between the USA and the Soviet Union. So people are people, there's a psychological uh, dimension to anything that we do. So you know, the psychology of the space race. So this talk is understanding the space race and it is a development of a paper I gave at the ninth conference on the inspiration of astronomical phenomena at Gresham College in October, sorry, August 2015. So I'd, I'd like to begin with a couple of inspirational quotes. So this is um, Leo Tolstoy from uh, War and Peace, War and Peace. And this is Pierre talking, Pierre the former a decadent aristocrat who becomes uh, something of a uh, theosophist, joins the, the Masons. He says, don't I feel that in my soul I am part of the vast harmonious whole? Don't I feel that I constitute one link, that I make a degree in the ascending scale from the lower orders of creation to the higher ones? In this immense, immeasurable multitude of beings in which the Godhead, the supreme force, if you prefer the term, is manifest. If there is a God in a future life, then there is a truth and goodness, and man's highest happiness consists in striving to attain them. We must live, we must love, we must believe that we have life, not only today on this scrap of earth, but that we have lived and shall live forever there in the whole. Pierre was saying, and he pointed to the sky. So those are Tolstoy's words. And those sensibilities are ones that are shared in general by a modern body called the Overview Institute, which you can easily find online, which is founded by uh, astronauts and people involved in the American space program and whose function and purpose is explicitly to try and save the planet because these are the people, the astronauts, who have seen the single planet from space. So. Um, anyway, part of the purpose of this talk is to uh, participate in the conversation of the development of an ethical policy for the development of space, which lots and lots of people are thinking of. So I can't formulate a policy, but I wish to raise certain um, ideas. And I've uh, got an image on the left there of the book Commercial Space Exploration, which came out last year, which I've got a, a chapter at the beginning talking about ethical issues and the, the publication of the book was partly prompted by the need to respond to what is now the rapid acceleration of human activity in near space with the, uh, first of all space tourism and then the possibility of industrial exploitation of asteroids. So what do we all have in common above us? The sky and what do we all have in common beneath us? The earth. One earth and one sky. So the earth is currently suffering all sorts of difficult environmental pressures. People have different solutions as to how they will be solved. Uh, and that is what I'm going to end this talk with, consideration of those. But first of all, Max Weber. Now, so if, if we want to understand narratives and dialogues about human activity in space. We need a framework for doing so. So Max Weber is one sociologist who provides this. Now Weber's uh, discussion of kinds of rationality is spread throughout his work. So I'm relying heavily here on Stephen Kalberg's essay on Max Weber's types of rationality. And Kalberg identifies four kinds of rationality in Weber, practical, theoretical, substantive, and formal. So I'm going to talk about the two I've highlighted in bold, 
practical rationality and theoretical rationality. Also, uh, we can use the terms technical instead of practical and value instead of theoretical. So th th those make it quite clear. Technical rationality, you might guess, concerns quantification measurement and value rationality, the value we put on things. Um, and then also I've been using this book by Donald Spence, Narrative Truth and Historical Truth, Meaning and Interpretation in Psychoanalysis. So you know, psychoanalysts, when they are talking to their analysands, have to try and work out what level of truth, if any, is being related to them. Uh, some psychoanalysts would say, well, that's not really an important question, but on occasion it is an important question. So Spence contrasts objective or historical truth with narrative truth. So as you might guess, objective and historical <coughs> truth relate to things which we can agree happened. A narrative truth is the description of those things and descriptions are always accounts which different people disagree with and therefore describe events which probably we cannot agree happen. So objective truth may be embodied in technology, budgets, finances, and in terms of space celestial mechanics. How much thrust do you need to launch a rocket into space? And narrative truth is then ideological and cultural contexts, propaganda, film, uh, conspiracy theorists, people who think that the uh, Apollo moon landing never happened. Well, that's, that's an example of narrative truth. New age and new religious movements and how we identify the cultural consequences of our interaction with space. All these things may be narrative truths or value rationality, as Weber would say. So if we look at this speech, and this is John F. Kennedy's speech to Congress on the 25th of May 1961, in which he appealed for funds for uh, the uh, American Moon Programme. So this is really important because just very shortly before this, the Soviet Union had put Yuri Gagarin into space. And this is, remember, the height of the Cold War, just after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the USA goes into a panic. So Kennedy uh, goes along to Congress and gives this speech. And the first part of the speech is like this. We propose to accelerate the development of the appropriate lunar spacecraft. We propose to develop alternative liquid and solid fuel boosters, etc., etc., And we propose additional funds for other engine development. Well, that's not going to get people standing up and applauding and voting funds. So then he said, finally, if we are to win the battle that is now going on around the world between freedom and tyranny, the dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks, referring to the Soviet Union, should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik, again, the Soviet Union, in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. So it's time for all Americans to choose. And there's only one thing they can choose, which is to choose freedom over tyranny. And that means voting money for the moon program. So that's on the right hand side, what Donald Spence would call narrative truth and what Max Weber called value rationality. That's the value that's being put on the enterprise. It's the narrative, the story that John Kennedy was telling about it. So let's just um, scroll forward to 1st of October 2003. The uh, United States Air Force uh, Space Command Strategic Master Plan, FY06 and beyond. This is a paragraph from it. The Strategic Master Plan describes how we will transform this command into a space combat command. It outlines how we will sustain, modernize, divest, and transform our forces in order to maximize our war fighting capacity capabilities. This plan is the command's roadmap to ensure our military remains dominant in space, in the air, on the ground, and on the sea. That's fairly unambiguous. 
Not many people are, for, are, are familiar with this document. There's a lot of concern with Chinese militarization of space at the moment, not much with um, America. This is why this issue of ethics is important, just to, to move forward to the end of my talk. Because if space is going to be militarized, then it's up to other people to try and develop some sort of regulatory framework which has to be based on ethical considerations in order to try and control this. So, um, this is, um, I was going to go back here to 1936. Um, in 1936, a group of Caltech students led by Frank Molina, this is the passage on the left, um, conducted a rocket experiment in a dirt gulch in Pasadena. Now, a few years ago, NASA held a, uh, a, a party in order to um, commemorate this uh, event. And on the left-hand side, um, is the uh, passage from the invitation to the party. So I'll read it out. On Halloween day in 1936, a group of Caltech students led by Frank Malina conducted the first stand-up rocket engine test in a dirt gulch known to the residents of Pasadena as the Arroyo. Little did they know that this day would go down in history as the beginning of what is now JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the world's leading centre for robotic exploration of the solar system and beyond. So the rest of the invitation NASA sent out was in terms of you know, when, where, <coughs> where to go, when to go there and so on. Purely you know, ob objective rationality, the, the date, the event, the place and so on. Along with the invitation came this passage. So let's just look at this passage that uh, was sent out. <clears throat> well, first of all, Halloween is a day of mystery and magic when the dead walk the earth. So if you wonder why you should go to this party to commemorate Frank Molina's enterprise with the Caltech students, well, hey, you know, it celebrates Halloween. It's magical. You may have fun. The rocket was uh, launched by students. Molina was a student, young radicals. OK, so everybody now knows this is uh, a long time afterwards that students may be young radicals. And also everybody in America goes to college. Students are kind of every man. So this is in 2011. The party was in 2011. Most people in the USA were students at some time in their lives or other. The rocket launch took place in a dirt gulch. Well, you know what a dirt gulch is. A dirt gulch is that uh, little uh, sort of uh, little valley, steep-sided steep dry valley, uh, through which cowboys and Indians and bandits make their escape and chase each other in westerns. That's a gulf. So it's dramatic. It's a piece of it's evoking the Wild West. Robotic exploration of the solar system and all space beyond. Uh, well, you know, we're going to other galaxies, perhaps. And in egalitarian America, anyone can change history. These young students changed history and set the scene for robotic exploration of the world. So let's change the narrative, OK? So this is a big celebration for NASA. Everybody has to support NASA. NASA struggles to get funds from Congress. So NASA's, this is a big PR exercise by NASA. Let's change the narrative. So Frank Molina, this young Caltech student, he left NASA in 1947, disgusted by its employment of Nazis and its pursuit of the militarization of space. He was persecuted in the anti-communist witch hunts of 1952 and went into self-imposed exile in France where he started the art science magazine Leonardo. So that's the backstory of Frank Molina. You didn't get that in the press release. <laughs> With Molina on that day was John, brackets Jack, his more familiar name, Whiteside Parsons. It was Parsons who in 1942 made the crucial breakthrough in the development of rocket solid fuel. He used uh, asphalt and potassium perchlorate. Basically, it was Parsons who enabled the rocket launch to be successful. The rocket to be launched without blowing up. So this is Parsons. In 1942, he was appointed as head of the Agape Lodge by Alistair Crowley. Of course, you all know Alistair Crowley, the so-called notorious occultist and magician of the 20th century. 
This is what Jack Parsons wrote. Magic is in, okay, wrote, this is a book published in 1989, but he obviously wrote it uh, way back. Magic is a system of philosophy and a way of life which a common denominator of all cultures and is universal to mankind. It is therefore essential that the magician have a comprehensive knowledge of the various planes whose interaction results in comprehensive reality. And we go on then with um, uh, Parsons. Alistair Crowley, in uh, material well known to Parsons, said, Every man and woman is a star. And then said, A star is a god. Plunge from the height, O God, he wrote, and interlock with man. So, as a scientist, Parsons was clear that the scientific and magical worldviews are compatible. It is therefore essential that the magician have a comprehensive knowledge of the various planes whose interaction results in comprehensive reality. And this is uh, Parsons again. Parsons said, at the end of the age of Osiris, which he thought was uh, he was transitioning into, feeling himself unloved and unknowing of the way to live, Western man moves in a sterile wasteland of the mind, lacking the knowledge, understanding, and will to save himself by an act of love. So, um, let me just go back. So, uh, Parsons and Molina, okay, how do we change the narrative? Those two Caltech students on that morning were one who was later persecuted by being a communist and one who was uh, a, a practicing magician and a cultist. So those are the founders of the United States space program. Okay? That was not on the NASA press release. <laughs> Perhaps, you know, more fun would have been had if it was. You know, if you say the US space program is founded by somebody who's persecuted for being a communist and resigned in protest at the employment of Nazis and an occultist magician, it might get more support. <laughs> anyway, coming to the UK, there was a major outburst of, rash of value rationality which accompanied the journey of the British astronaut Tim Peake to the International Space Station in December 2015. And down uh, on the lower right hand so, uh, side of this slide, you'll see a lot of school children waving Union Jacks. Okay, so the TV program Stargazing Live, presented by Brian Cox and Dara O'Brien, there in the bottom middle, was used to promote the identification of the space program with nationalist pride. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and the launch was broadcast live uh, to commentary by the presenters by Cox and O'Brien from the Science Museum. There was this big audience of school children. They were all given flags to wave and they all expressed excitement and enthusiasm at the prospect of going into space. Nothing wrong with that. I'd do the same. But the message was clear. To support the space program is to be patriotic. So just like you had to choose, you had to, to, to choose freedom to support the American space program initially, freedom over tyranny. Now you have to wave your Union Jack. However, okay, there were different narratives. Quickly, these the, the different narratives emerged in the reporting. So um, there was this reporting that, that, that Peake was the first British astronaut. So um, here's one quote, for example. Technically, Peake was the first Briton to join the European Space Agency's astronaut corps. This is uh, in sample uh, writing in The Guardian. Fair enough. But however, the notion of the first became compressed so that Peake was the first official British astronaut. And then there's a quote from a website. A 37-year-old helicopter test pilot has joined the European Space Agency as Britain's first official astronaut. And this, this was this notion of first that really um, excited people, was used to excite people. Finally, there's the British astronaut. However, there was then a small media storm on the grounds that Helen Sharman had been the first British astronaut. And so, uh, this, you know, a few journalists picked this up. Jennifer Rigby observed in the Telegraph women's pages the first 
official British astronaut was easily contracted as first British astronaut. Um, and uh, then a journalist started saying, well, this, you know, this, this, is, this is not uh, fair. The first woman British astronaut is being written out of history. Actually, if you go online, there are various other people who have been claimed to be the first British, British astronaut uh, on various uh, grounds. So Peake was neither the first British astronaut nor the first official British astronaut. So even Wikipedia, who I consult if I want to know what Wikipedia says, <laughs> um, observes that the definition of British astronaut is somewhat fluid. Okay, so what was behind the narrative that he was the first? So an obvious suspect must include pressure on UK government to fund human space travel. So then the guard, this is the Guardian from 2009. The appointment of Peake announced a special ceremony at the Space Agency said courts in Paris yesterday is surprising because Britain has a long-standing policy of refusing to fund human spaceflight. Although Britain is the fourth largest contributor to the European Space Agency, its £200 million annual donation is used exclusively for satellites and robotic missions. Then let's move forward again. Following Peak's launch in December 2015, the British Interplanetary Society made a substantial argument for the UK funding of human space travel. So here's, I've just copied and pasted the uh, BIS's material. The BIS is delighted that in May 2009, the European Space Agency appointed Major Tim Peake of the UK as a new European astronaut. So now he's a European astronaut. No. Now Tim has flown on Expedition 46, 47 to the ISS in December 2015 via Soyuz, which is excellent for the UK. Also, here we get to it, in November uh, 2012, the UK Science Minister David Willits confirmed at the ESA ministerial meeting that £12 million would be put into the uh, ELIPS microgravity research initiative and £16 million will help support UK involvement in the NASA Orion crewed spacecraft for the future. Okay, so there's a clear link being made here. Tim Peake is appointed uh, as a, a signal that the UK needs to fund human space travel, because how can the UK have a British astronaut without putting some money into this? And then three years later, indeed, the UK did decide to support UK involvement in uh, the NASA Orion crewed spacecraft program. Not into the European uh, funding, though. And so uh, we go on, um, whilst the rest of Europe, the US, Russia, China, Japan, and many emerging industrialized nations, for example, Brazil, Malaysia, South Korea, and India, all explore space through human approaches, the UK has missed out. This is against the national good. So again, the strong argument is being made that the UK needs to directly fund human space travel because it's for the national good. And so we then we're going to skip from there to the programme Stargazing Live, uh, getting school children into the Science Museum and giving them Union Jacks to wave. It's all part of uh, Weber's value rationality, Spence's uh, uh, narrative, to try and weave a story around going up to the sky. So, um, Narratives then, commercial exploitation and militarization of space. So we have um, NASA entering the private moon rush on the left hand side. That's from the new scientist. Um, and then on the right hand side, what's needed is a test case to see how individual governments will react to claims on commercial space investments. So even if you go into space, you might ask, who owns what? If you decide to go and say, well, I own this asteroid. Who's going to tell you you don't? So there's a Wild West up there. And there's just the book again, Commercial Space Exploration. Um, on the right-hand side, another very useful book, Outer Space, Weapons, Diplomacy and Security, which discusses the militarization issue. Now, um, legally, as a species, according to the United Nations, there's a claim that we all own the moon. Uh, you can just Google this. This is the United Nations 
Office for Outer Space Affairs. You probably didn't know there was one. And so um, there was uh, a moon um, agreement. These things were discussed from 1972 to five. But even so, there's some disagreement about whether you can just go to the moon and plant yourself down and start mining for heavy metals. So this problem is being discussed. This is a paper by Mark Williamson from Space Policy. He said, space demands a somewhat different ethical policy philosophy based on specialized, sorry, detailed knowledge of the space environment, but must progress from the philosophical and academic and be targeted, he said, towards the design of an ethical code of policy to be of any practical use. So, so there, there, these discussions are uh, happening. So ethics, if we think about ethics then, um, we need uh, yeah, a dic simple dictionary definition from the Collins Concise English Dictionary. A code of behaviour con considered correct, especially that for a particular group, profession or individual. Which doesn't really help because who considers what is correct? Now, there are different schools of ethics. There's deontology, in which one obeys rules and duty. Consequentialism, in which you look at your outcomes of reactions. Is this mine, is fracking going to pollute under you know, deep water supplies, for example? It's consequentialism. And virtue ethics, ethics based on one's character, morality, humanity, where you might think the universe has a value, and therefore, or the planet has a value and therefore needs protecting because it has intrinsic value. So Mark Williamson identified the problem, popular views um, of space among scientists. He said, um, basically, a lot of scientists, he's saying, see space as a limitless alien void populated by huge and indestructible stars, a handful of barren planets and swarms of potentially dangerous comets. From this point of view, the space environment is hardly in need of uh, protection. Okay, that's one view. But then he said, what scientists do need to think preserving is the relative purity of the space environment. So the surface of the moon until it's disturbed is, from our point of view, a pristine environment. Actually, it's not really because it's constantly being hit by asteroids, but it's not being interfered with by humanity. So it's, it's pristine. So Williamson says there's something there in the scientific narrative that we can use. So what should ethics be based? So this is the World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology. Subcommission report, year 2000, on the ethics of outer space. Just a mind summary here. The Commerce report explicitly ruled out emotional appeals for the protection of space, arguing that scientific evidence alone should be sufficient to formulate an ethical policy for outer space. So stick to the facts. Don't worry about whether the universe has any intrinsic value. Just think, well, will it be harmful if we blow up this particular asteroid? You know, will it cause all sorts of debris to fly around which may hit satellites or land on the Earth? But this problem is already being, you know, it's already rehearsed extensively by environmentalists here on Earth. All these discussions um, have been had. Now, there's a, there's a weakness that climate change scientists have found when it comes to presenting scientific data. They found that if they just argue that uh, pollution is causing climate change, from their experience, some of them have found people don't listen to them. Okay? Um, so their evidence is dismissed by two emotional appeals, two, two pieces of value rationality. One is that economic liberty is fundamental to American identity. Therefore, if somebody wants to pollute something in the pursuit of profit, that's fine. And, the, and therefore, opposition to exploitation of the environment is fundamentally un-American. That's a problem faced by climate change scientists in the USA. Um, however, the fact that science speaks for itself and it is not borne out by the actual debate. So scientists themselves do stir up narratives here. So narratives, you know, the evidence of the effect of climate change is always accompanied by dire warnings of its consequences. The sea level is going to rise one metre or two metres or three metres and so on. So it does depend on narratives of fear. 
So, you know, what narratives can we provide? Outer space or outer place? So here on planet Earth, we can use the word space and place interchangeably. I can say there's a space at the back of the room or there's a place at the back of the room. But we always talk about outer space. We don't talk about outer place. So a lot of the conversations that take place about take place about the importance of space or place here on the planet do talk about place. So we can take those ideas and project them into space. So I'm proposing we talk about outer place. So we have that you know, double use of the word um, space. Sometimes use them interchangeably. We can say I am in a good space or I am in a good place. But what happens if we talk about um, outer place? So here's um, Belden Lane, the uh, author whom quite a few of you have come across now in his book Landscapes of the Sacred, Geography and Narrative in American Spirituality. I'm just going to read the, this. As the human spirit is inexorably drawn to the appeal of place, whether real or imaginary. Landscape, after all, is a constructed reality, a form which is given to nature by a particular human perception. The poet also reminds us that sacred places are, first of all, storied places, elaborately woven together on a cultural loom that joins every detail of the landscape within a given community of memory. So these are the ways in which people talk about landscape. So uh, what we can do is talk in the same way about skyscape, as we're already doing, but also outer space or outer place. So it's very easy to begin to give uh, the space up there, which is now the threat of militarization, industrialization, and so on, some sort of value which makes sense to us in terms of the, the stories we're already telling about our home planet. So, landscape and skyscape. So, you know, there's a persistent narrative in Western culture which portrays space as pristine. This is not just one for scientists and often pristine in relation to relative corruption of the earth. So, you know, when we look up at the sky from an out, uh, earth center perspective, we don't see outer space. We see the sky. Even at night, if we're looking at distant stars, we refer to the wonder of the night or starry sky, not to outer space. So what I'm suggesting is that if outer space doesn't have that value, we can transfer narratives of to the sky narratives of storied place in our culture. Anyway, just some examples. Space is threatening. These are stories which are told. Just some uh, 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 magazine covers I collected from the New Scientist, The Economist, and the one on the bottom right, my favourite, Aliens in Underpants Save the World. <laughs> They're going to be rescued from somewhere else. Or The Saviour. The astronaut's hero, priest or psychopomp. Um, here's Yuri, Yuri Gagarin um, and this quote from a book by Stephen Shukakis. The heavens formerly the province of priests were now to be seized by uniformed astronauts. This is 2009. I think that's a bit enthusiastic, but still it makes the point you know, the astronaut as hero as articulated in films like this, Armageddon with Bruce Willis, the rugged oil man who with no training goes into space to save the earth by blowing up a rogue, yeah. is it a rogue comet? Looks him with his jaw jutting out. <laughs> but, you know, here's an example of the narrative of uh, up there, whatever we call it, space or skyscape, whatever, is pristine. Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor, Stoic philosopher, surveyed the circling stars as though yourself or in mid-course with them, often picture the changing and rechanging dance of the elements. Visions of this kind purge away the dross of our earthbound life. Now that's the kind of thing which any amateur astronomer will agree with. Why do people stay up all night, often in the cold, with their woolly hats and mittens on, trying to see the stars? Because they love it. Why do they love it? Because it makes them feel better. They might not have this language, but I would say if you did some qualitative research and said, does this vision help purge away the dross of your earthbound life, you'd find a lot of people saying yes. 
So seeing the earth from space, consequences. Here's another narrative. This is Stuart Brand. Stuart Brand was part of the psychedelic culture in mid-1960s California. And um, he uh, became fascinated by the fact that the Apollo uh, astronauts had taken uh, photographs of the Earth from space. And he wanted to get hold of these. Well, this is you know, a long time ago now, 50 years ago. Communication was far slower. How did you get hold of a NASA photograph? And um, he eventually did. He, 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 he came up with this brainwave uh, of a campaign to get hold of the, uh, the photographs. He realized it was not sensible to appeal to NASA's better nature. So he started this campaign. He says, why can't we see the NASA photographs? And he, so he almost, con you know, he created almost a little conspiracy theory. So the photographs were released. And it was Brand who then triggered the idea that the vision of the whole Earth from space should take us towards the notion of you know, a global community um, and a global community devoted to saving our planet. And so he published the first whole Earth catalogue in 1968. And then we have the overview effect, which I described earlier named by Frank White in 1917 in order to describe the sometimes transcendental experiences reported by some astronauts when seeing Earth from space for the first time. And this is the Overview Institute. Look it up on the internet. We lived a critical moment in human history. The challenges of climate change, food, water and energy shortages, as well as the increasing disparity between the developed and developing nations, are testing our will to unite. While differences in religions, cultures and politics continue to keep us apart. The creation of a global village through satellite TV and the internet is still struggling to connect the real world into one community. At this critical moment, our greatest need is for a global vision of planetary unity and purpose for humanity as a whole. Mm -hmm. These are not wild eco-pagans. Uh, these are people in the heart of NASA, NASA engineers and astronauts. So let's just consider environmental thought in general. It's a continual complaint I know, of a few of us that, that the sky is completely left out of accounts of human history. History of ideas, history of politics, history of religion, history of whatever. And, and part of you know, the Sophia Center's mission is to put the sky back. So you can look at environmental texts like, like these I've cited here. Dobson, Green Political Thought, Eckersley, Environmentalism and Political Theory, Westrams, uh, and so on. Um, they all review environmental and ecological theories, but none has anything to say about outer space. So they're all, they're all concerned with little environment down here. Even though, I mean, the sky is pretty important in terrestrial environmentalism. The, the air carries pollution. So, okay, current green political thought can, can distinguishes two fundamental approaches. Um, there's environmentalism, which is often pragmatic, managerial. So you say, we've got a problem, you know, um, this road runs through a wild flower meadow. Uh, how are we going to deal with this problem? This mine is polluting this area. How are we going to deal with this problem in a managerial sense? And then there's ecologism, which argues for radical changes in our relationship with the non-human natural world. Uh, and uh, so places humans with, within the, the framework natural world, utterly integrated within it. And then we get the, the extreme that ecocentrism in which people will say, well, actually, the, the environment matters more than people. And actually, there are examples of ecocentrism that are quite damaging. Uh, for example, in Africa, where, pe where people get moved from their land in order to create safari parks. So, OK, um, just to, to clarify that then, environmental thought um, in general, ecocentrism subsumes humanity entirely within the ecological system. Um, and ecologists and ecocentrics tend to e de-anthropocentrize the world, okay, so take the people out of it. 
So here we come to Patrick Curry, one of our one of our staff on the in the Sophia Centre, who argues for uh, the development of virtue ethics. Okay, so virtue ethics are based on the classical idea, which you'll find in um, Aristotle. Human beings do not exist separate to the rest of the universe. Fundamental idea, not really a controversial idea, but one which is all too easily um, ignored. So Patrick Curry proposes extending classical virtue ethics to green virtue ethics. So that um, escapes the anthropocentrism which uh, um, prioritizes human interests alone. So how are we going to manage the environment and minimize pollution? And also uh, moves away from extreme ecocentrism in which human beings are essentially written out of the formula. Um, so um, he says we are beings not only on but of the earth. Stan Rowe said we are earthlings first, human seconds. So we belong on the earth, but human seconds. To embed human interests in nature as well as the wide cosmos does not mean devaluing it, but instead binds human welfare to the health of the wider environment. So to adapt Curry and Rowe, I propose we are creatures not only in, but of space and of outer space already, and we are spacelings first, human seconds. So we can look at other more recent stories about our planet. Um, one is of the delicate tiny body floating in an infinity of space. That's Carl Sagan's blue, pale blue dot. That's the one that's so fragile, so delicate, we need to protect it. Another is the global village then, the global village of the Apollo photographs. To extend, so to extend these stories to space, we have a space to be nourished and valued without national boundaries and private property. One of which human beings, as virtue ethics uh, claims, are embedded in the cosmos. And their welfare is independent with its welfare, and they have a right to say how the exploitation of space is regulated. So in other words, if we're all part of it, and the Americans or the Chinese want to militarize it, or some private companies want to mine asteroids, therefore, Green Virtue Ethics says, it is all our right, our fundamental right, by virtue of being human and citizens of outer space, that we have a fundamental right to say what happens there. So then my uh, conclusion by arguing that all humans are rational, also, Weber removes the dichotomy between the rational and the irrational. Value rationality provides a framework for analysing motives for and responses to the space programme. Now, when narrative truth is used, narratives can be selected to suit particular purposes. But, you know, we, can, we shouldn't be overwhelmed by the narratives that are pushed to us. So that uh, press release to go to the party to celebrate Frank Molina's rocket launch can be completely subverted and changed around in a way that both Frank Molina and Jack Parsons, who launched the rocket, would approve of. And so, you know, Tim Peake's flight in 2015-16 was manipulated with nationalist imagery in order to boost space funding. Well, fair enough, but I think we should be quite aware that there was an overt manipulation of it and that the BBC stargazing live programme was overtly used for such manipulation. So this is my slide from the... Um, talk the inspiration of astronomical phenomena, just saying the inspiration we derive from our experience of astronomical phenomena is of profound political importance. We look at the sky, that's not a politically neutral action, it's a politically charged action. We do something to the sky, it's a politically charged action. And a last word, this is Caitlin Moran, one of my favourite journalists. We are already in space, the Earth is in space, it tells you all you need to know about how we think right now that we presume we are anything other than on a space mission right now and always have been. Yeah. That's it.